quick question. After we graduated, yeah. did you come straight here or did you do something else first? No, I came straight here. Okay. I thought I was gonna go back to Dallas, where, right. which is where I had my summer internship after, or between okay. my senior year. I thought I was gonna go back to EDS, mm -hmm. Ross Perol's old company. Okay. And um, I met Bi I'd met Bill my senior year and I was leaving here and Kurt Simic offered me an internship. Okay. And so I did a round robin internship here at the foundation in a bunch of different areas. And when I left, I didn't have a job. And I went home and then Kurt finally called me and said, hey, I have two job opportunities. Which one do you want? <laughs> and so then I decided to take that one rather than the job offer back home okay. and stay up here. Nice. All right, cool. Yeah. I thought that was maybe the case, but I couldn't remember. There was a, no, I've you been did here. something else first. No, I, this okay. will be next month. I'll have been here 29 years. Wow. That's a long time, yeah. and I, you know what does yeah. that say? Yeah. Does it say that you know you're really dedicated and passionate about the work that you do? Because I think I am. Yes. But or does it say that I'm afraid of change and I'm not <laughs> willing to go anywhere else? If you're looking too deeply, maybe. I would say that for certainly the former, but at the same time, I, I mean, it shows um, the work that you've done here. I mean. It, we don't have that many employees that have been with us for 29 years, and if we mm -hmm. had, then I, I would say not only they dedicated, but then clearly they're doing something right. Otherwise, either they would have left on their own or some other been, option. We would have freed <laughs> up, their future future would have been freed up. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> exactly right. Well, so Heroes Foundation has been in existence since '97. No, uh, May of 2001. Or, okay. Sorry, May of 2000. It kind of started, but yeah. really the. Um, 2001 is kind of the first official year, so 2025 will okay. be our 25th year, technically. Mm -hmm. We are 25th gala in January. Yeah. Okay. Which is crazy. Yeah. We're coming. Yeah. yeah. You should. You guys. We are coming. Get JT there. Um, anybody else you want to bring down here? Okay. Bring them on I'll do up. it. Should be a good one. 25th, right? Mm -hmm. Gotta go big. Blow out. Cello yeah. shots and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I can make them. That's the kind of party you have. It's well. <laughs> Everyone look under your chair. In the early years, <laughs> yes. And we, we probably should. I mean, hey. Might as well. And then they, it's all all for philanthropy. Right? Yeah. You might want to cut that part. Yellow <laughs> shots for philanthropy. That's yeah. a new fundraiser. I've heard yeah. of Lemonade Days. Is and that part of the Students Helping Students program? Uh, in that case, it probably should be. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We'll have all the uh, 21 and over undergrads come up to serve everyone yeah. in Jello shots in their tuxes. That'd be sweet. Oh. Yeah. Is this thing on? Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Summits Podcast. Thank all of you for joining us for this episode. Wherever you get your podcast, or if you're tuning in on the Heroes Foundation YouTube channel, thank you very much for doing so. Pretty excited about this one. Been a longtime friend from back in the IU days. Uh, there's some things we want to share on this episode. Some things probably best not share on this episode, uh, but it's going to be a good one regardless. Uh, Miss Sarah Begg. Sarah has been with the IU Foundation ever since we graduated in like 2015. Okay. <laughs> nice try. 1995. I that. For those, you know, keeping track. Uh, she is the Senior VP of Advancement Services here at the IU Foundation. So Sarah, welcome to the Summits Podcast. Great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, why don't you introduce yourself for all our, our viewers and watchers? Well, so you've known me for a long time. So mother of three kids, um, wife to my husband, Bill, and um, a really strong, I have a really strong faith, family and friends. And then of course this, um, how I've gotten to reconnect with you, which is through my role here at the IU Foundation. Yeah. Um, you said Plano, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, Born and raised there? I was born and raised there, but I was okay. the product of two Hoosiers. My parents okay. are both from Fort Wayne, as oh, really? is yeah. most of my family um, mm -hmm. on that side. I have lots of cousins who are IU grads. And um, when I moved to Texas, the only place that I could justify out-of-state tuition was Indiana University. At the time, when I came to college, or when I was choosing colleges, I think a credit hour at the University <laughs> of Texas was about 15 dollars a credit hour and still we took my, my parents were wonderful they knew how much I loved IU and um, still supported my efforts to get here well good on them yeah can you imagine $15 a credit hour today oh my goodness <laughs> three kids in college I think I would love that that would be <laughs> awesome yeah 
All right, so you came to IU, and in, in theory, you've never left, which is great. That's, That's true. That's a huge, mm -hmm. huge benefit to mm -hmm. IU, huge benefit to the Bloomington community. Um, but as we were talking about before, I think that says something about you. And you, and you were saying, well, does it, does it say this or does it really say this? I, I think what it says is, yes, your commitment, uh, your loyalty, um, but you're very good at what you do. And that goes back to when we got to know each other at the IU Student Foundation. That's right. And I think it just has transcended here and it hasn't, hasn't changed. No, my love for the university hasn't changed. Programs like the Student Foundation um, and a lot of the other things that the university does and the role that it plays in our community and yeah. in our state um, and with our alumni all over the world, it really is, it's kind of a passion point for people mm -hmm. as it is me. It would be a lot easier to go do something else, not work, whatever, but um, I love it here and I mm -hmm. love the people that I work with and the people that I get to reconnect with. So, yep. thank you. <laughs> That's saying something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And your daughter. Right. I mean, right. That, that's yeah. a huge highlight. A lot yeah. of us who are in our 50s, um, you know, a lot of folks have their kids coming back now. Right. And so that has been absolutely a huge joy yeah. of being here in Bloomington, being a part of the foundation where, you know, we get to reconnect like with awesome kids like mm -hmm. your Mia. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a brain fart. <laughs> so you, go? you mentioned um, you, go. you had a, um, an op you interned down in Texas when you graduated. Uh, well, before I graduated. graduated, yes, before and I graduated. And then you graduated. did an internship at the foundation. I did. What was that experience like? Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. I had just come off a wonderful year-long stint at the IU Student Foundation, okay. which is a student organization here on campus that's dedicated to teaching students about philanthropy. Mm -hmm. It's best known for Little 500, IU Sing, okay. and things yeah. like that. And yeah. Vinny and I did that together. And it was really incredible. Mm -hmm. And I had thought that I was going to go back and be in community relations with a company down in Dallas. It was the company that both of my parents worked for. Okay. Um, but instead, um, Kurt Simic, who was president of the foundation uh, at the time, said, hey, I really think you should try, try this out. Mm -hmm. Stay here. So I spent a summer working in areas like Telefund, when we, back when we had a Telefund, <laughs> oh, called yeah. people after uh -huh. dark, <laughs> um, trying to get money. That's a telephone. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Got it. it it was, yeah. Yeah. yeah, rotary. <laughs> we called the phone. It might have even been rotary, you know, back in that day. Uh -huh. um, worked in uh, annual giving, okay. which is just the solicitation that you get, you know, mm -hmm. in the mail. Yep. Planned giving, um, working on files and trying to understand why people might um, give some of their estate to the university when they pass. Okay. I worked in major gifts as kind of a back office person, wa person watching development officers do their thing, and then prospect research, which which is where I ultimately ended up for my first job. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you've seen all the different aspects of philanthropy. Um, any any of them really stand out to you? I mean, in terms of obviously it's 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 massively important. Um, but there are any any aspects of it that really stand out to you in terms of that that, that you enjoyed seeing or enjoyed working with the most? Oh goodness, um, it's interesting. So from 20, uh, so here, 2000 to 2011, I was a part-time employee. I did special projects. And when you do special projects, you get a variety of different assignments. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah. Um, so one, the two things that I think stand out for me the most, in my, even just in my career here, happened um, around, you know, in that in that window. One would be um, our internship program. I had such a great experience there mm -hmm. that um, they wanted to put something formal together. What they do today is 10 times better than anything <laughs> I ever did. It's way more professional. The Daniel C. Smith internship program is second to none. But back in the aughts. Um, we, um, we had students that came through here who wanted to experience philanthropy. They wanted to be more connected to IU. Mm -hmm. And um, some of those students have gone on and stayed here um, for employment or they've gone out and they've done great things other places. I still keep in touch with a lot of them. And, you know, connecting with, like I said, those kids of friends from college, that's been a pretty wonderful experience yeah. just to see those kids launch with a love for IU and a little bit better idea of what the foundation does. 
Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that I'm, I don't know if it's, I'm probably the most proud of, or one of the things that I'm most proud of, is the work that we did to elevate women's philanthropy at IU. When I got here and started my job in 95 in prospect research, um, one of the assignments that I was given by my boss at the time, Kathy Wilson, was to help research women who might want to be a part of something that we then called the Colloquium for Women of IU, which was an mm -hmm. event that we had had up until last year. So it, it's it's been pretty long standing. Mm -hmm. And it was a time where we would bring women together because not every w woman wanted to go to a football game or a mm -hmm. basketball game, which is where at that time we were bringing couples to go. Yeah. And um, this was supposed to be something just for women and for their interests. And at the time it was led by our first lady of IU, uh, Peg Brand. And she was an incredible mentor. She was strong, she was tough, uh, and she really had a vision. And then over the years and subsequent first ladies, particularly particularly with Lori Burns McRobbie, who um, her husband was president up until 2020, hmm. uh, was really instrumental in making women's philanthropy and building it into what it is today with the Women's Leadership, uh, Count, Women's Philanthropy Leadership Council. There have been other philanthropy circles that have grown out of that, the Black nice. Philanthropy Circle, the Queer Philanthropy Circle, and I think in the near future, a Latina um, Philanthropy Circle. And so I think being a part of something when it started is something that I'm really proud of and I've loved to see how it's grown and evolved. Mm -hmm. There's no better compliment, I think, to um, the work you do, whether it's in behind the scenes or it's in leadership. If you have a little seed and you watch others help it grow yeah. um, and it turns into something great, it's, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah. nice. agreed. Uh, so you have a new role here at the mm -hmm. IU Foundation. I do. Talk to us about that. Well, I'm one week in, and okay. um, so you're an expert now. I, I'm an expert. <laughs> I'm, I am literally drinking through a fire hose. Right. So mm -hmm. I had a new advancement services pillar here. It is a mixture of six different um, departments here at the foundation. Prospect research, so it's like yeah. a little bit like going home. Um, the advancement data services group, which handles all of the data in and out of our foundation uh, CRM, our database yeah. um, event which I love and just have such admiration for all of the work they do. Our donor relations department, which is really strong in the work that it does for a lot of our high level events, high level giving societies. The Heroes Foundation is a part is a part of that world. Um, revenue operations, which is what we do um, when a donor makes a gift, the money comes in and we make sure it's attributed to the right person or people, yeah. and then um, account administration, which is how we, pro it's so large, but probably what it's best known for is how we process gift agreements and mm -hmm. make sure that donor intent is followed. Yeah. And so all of those people are coming together. And right now what we're trying to do is find the commonalities between those groups, because our ultimate goal is to make all of our services incredibly smooth, mm -hmm. um, our processes seamless, so that our development officers don't have to scramble and find um, find contacts or information about things um, in a complicated way. Mm -hmm. They can do it a lot easier, which in turn frees them up to mm -hmm. get back out on the road a little bit more, yep. but more importantly, really helps with the donor experience mm -hmm. because if they're not having to sputter or stall, then um, it's really gonna make it a lot easier for our donors. Mm -hmm. And we have a Cracker Jack leadership team. We just had our first all team meeting, all mm -hmm. 75 of us um, on Friday. And um, just to see the, the willingness to try something new in the room, it was pretty inspiring. So, so far nice. Monday of week two, is going well. Great, great. We're glad to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. Glad we could kick off uh, week two. For that's you. right. This this new uh, this new role of yours mm -hmm. is not going to interfere with you doing the intros at the President Circle event, will it? Rumor has it that I'm going to stay in role. Okay. All right. Rumor Perfect. has it. You have. There's a lot of attributes that that I could say um, about you, but your ability to introduce people and the way you handle that uh, is is great. I appreciate that. It's not just the glasses. 
<laughs> I always have my big red glasses right. on when I'm They're reading great. those. What I love about, you know, I was a substitute. Okay. I was I was a uh, last minute sub for that probably 10 years ago, and <laughs> the job has stayed with me since then. But my favorite part about it, and this probably I should have answered the question that you asked me earlier with this part of it too, is the stories. Mm. And so when we do get to read those stories at events like President Circle, or we do something similar with Partners in Philanthropy, which is another recognition group that we have here at the foundation um, it's telling people stories and getting to refine that yeah. so that there are special things that people remember um, or other people learn about them mm -hmm. that help connect them um, during events like that so yeah. it's it's a gift to me well, more so than anything yeah, it's a gift to us the way you do it that's that's very well done um, I have to ask this and you maybe have already answered it but I'm gonna ask it anyway what would you say of, of all the years you've been here, from undergrad through today, what what are you most proud of? Oh, wow. That is a really big question. Yeah. You could have given that to me yesterday and I could have thought about it a I little bit. <laughs> you, could, you could have. Um, hmm. I'm sure there are many. There are a lot of things that I'm proud of. Um, I think that what I am most proud of is, and this is gonna sound kind of silly, but there are a lot of people who loved it that were in our era of the foundation or my parents' era mm -hmm. of Indiana University who like to come back to campus. And I love when they come back and I'm able to find that um, special memory mm -hmm. that they have and connect it back to the way the university is today and also show them how the university has evolved. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. the work that I do, one of the things that I have found is that when alums come back, their their vision of Indiana University is freeze framed in their mind the day that <laughs> they left. Yeah, yeah. Whether it was something about jo you know jumping in Showalter Fountain or leaving their, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> jumping in Showalter Fountain <laughs> or <laughs> taking pictures on the Simon Scott Assembly Hall floor or whatever it was. That's how the university is supposed to remain. Oh. And so I think I'm most proud of, or at least I'm most happy to try to connect the old with the new yeah. and um, keep Indiana University special for the people who come back. Yeah, mm -hmm. we were talking about this earlier on the way in, um, whether you're talking about Bloomington or West Lafayette or Knoxville, We don't Tennessee. talk about West Lafayette. <laughs> we here, try not really. to. I just want to yeah. get a little nod. But <laughs> I'm wearing a guest tag. Yeah. I'm really glad yeah. to be here. I we're gonna I take a picture of that. You take a picture yeah, of yeah. um, But all these university towns are, are changing a lot. In, in a they lot are. of the same ways, and, and we're not going to get into like better or for worse or whatever. But to your point, when if someone's been away from from campus for a long time, they come back like, oh my God, so much has changed. <laughs> it's true, but then they hit that one or two or ten things that like, oh, that's still there, and all of a sudden the memories flash back. That's right. You're spot on in terms of that. Just that just kind of brings them back full circle, and and it, and it is cool. I mean, I, I you, that's a very good job. I think of yes change is, is the only constant in life, right? There's gonna be constant build out and, and expansion and growth and, and change of certain things that need to be changed, but there's also the traditional things that have remained and hopefully will remain for a long time. And I think those are the things that kind of bring us all back. And so even though I'm here somewhat regularly, I still love coming back to, just to, to take it all in again. And, and so you're, you're spot on there. Um, Sarah, you, you know the, the basis of the Heroes Foundation, the basis of this podcast, um, and you know, I already know this answer, but um, what is your cancer story? Well, ah, does everybody kind of go, ugh, when you ask them that story? <laughs> Typically, yes. Yeah. So we have a very unexpected cancer story and one that um, no parent ever, um, ever anticipates. So we have three kids, um, mm -hmm. a daughter and two sons, and my daughter is uh, was 23, she's now 25, and actually the second her second year, her cancerversary is this week. Yeah. Um, my daughter was 23 and was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Um, wow. ALK positive is the non, I think it's non-small cell lung cancer. Um, ALK is a gene, it's a mutation. It's a gene mutation. It's not hereditary. Mm. It's just one of those things. Mm -hmm. She was not a smoker, didn't come from a family of smokers. And 
um, <laughs> I mean, it acts, it absolutely rocked our world, um, still does in many ways, but it's, it's also kind of become a part of our new normal. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so she was 23, and I'm happy to tell you the story of how we found out she had cancer, if that, yeah. so um, she moved to New York City. She had a fantastic college career. She went to DePaul University in Greencastle, just really loved the people there, loved her sorority sisters, was very involved, moved to New York City um, to work for an invest investment banking firm um, that she had interned with for two summers. So hard charging, you know, 100 hour weeks, that kind of thing, run down, mm -hmm. not feeling great. And we thought for sure that she was just run down from working too hard. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden she started to not be able to keep food down. And so we, that was was in February of 22 and so she went to an ENT and the ENT said well you could have acid reflux you might need to sleep a little more you know try to eat a little more food and she said yeah I just don't feel great I had lost some weight so we started down the path she started down the path I've got to remember that that's the hard part about parenting adult kids mm -hmm. that she started um, her journey with getting um, tested for acid reflux or for any type of esophageal mm -hmm. um, issues or stomach issues we went through the process um, all of the scans and the x-rays and they didn't show anything and so we really you know other than you know heavy dose of like antacid we really didn't have a lot of answers and then in august of that summer we got a call on a sunday night my husband answered his phone and she was calling because she was walking herself to the emergency room because she thought she was having a heart attack and so I can hear my husband, Bill, talking on the phone to her. I start packing my bag to fly to New York um, while they're talking. And he's like, you know, Betsy, do you want to get an Uber? Or, you know, <laughs> how do you want to get to the... So I'm just going to walk. It'll be fine. And so she shows up at the ER and, the, and she's like, I think I'm having a heart attack. Well, how many 23-year-olds show up at the ER having a heart attack? Right. And um, it took them a minute, but then they let her come back. But they took her back and they did an x-ray and they immediately, she called us and said, mom, I don't know what's going on, but they saw something on the x-ray and they're transferring me to Weill Cornell Hospital in New York City. So by that point, we had, I had a 6 a.m. flight out. Bill was gonna stay home and just be ready. We thought, well, Surely it's not a heart attack. Maybe it's just all the acid reflux. You know, maybe something. Maybe she's stressed. Something. I mean, never dawned, never dawned on us mm -hmm. that it would be something different than that. So when we got, I got there on Monday morning um, and got to the hospital. Um, she was in. She was uh, in bed. She had all the things on her, and they had done a bunch of tests. And the doctor came in and said, well, we don't know exactly what it is, but we think it is some kind of cancer. It could be um, some sort of lymphoma. We're not sure yet. And so that was the first gasp. Mm -hmm. <sighs> mm -hmm. Okay, okay, we'll figure this out. I can still see her sitting there in her bed. And so um, they said they wanted to do um, a little bit more testing on her. And so, fine, so that was planned for Tuesday. In the meantime, we'd called my husband who had already talked to a local doctor here who'd been a wonderful reference for us and had seen Betsy's x-rays um, and said, Bill, you probably need to get out to New York. So Bill was coming in hot either Monday night or Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. And so Tuesday, uh, they did some, some more testing and found out that it was not lymphoma that it was some other type of cancer, but they weren't sure. They weren't sure if it was stomach cancer or um, esophageal cancer. They mentioned lung cancer, but it wasn't really something because her lungs, one of her lungs had collapsed and her entire chest was filled with fluid. That is why she thought she was having a heart attack mm -hmm. because all of her organs had pushed over um, because her lung had collapsed. And so, it hurt yeah, <laughs> moving right. it over. Yeah. And so anyway, the long and the short of it is she went through um, a pretty 
big surgery that afternoon to try to get some of the, they went in and they took the fluid off of her lungs, tr still trying to figure out what was wrong with her, inserted a port mm. um, into her side. And by Tuesday evening or Wednesday morning, they had a better handle on the type of cancer and believed that it was lung cancer and that someone with her age and her history, it was likely this sort of rare, only 100,000 people a year are diagnosed um, with this type of cancer. And it's ALK plus. And um, it's mostly, it's, I think uh, it's, it's, I gotta think, make sure I've got this right. It is about, uh, I wrote it down. I know this isn't good for camera, but I'm gonna tell you this. Oh, 5% <laughs> of all lung cancers, so all of the lung cancers are, um, ALK positive, and mm -hmm. of that 5%, 30% are people under 40. So mm -hmm. um, treatment for this lung type of lung cancer has been around for not as long as, as other types of treatments. Yeah. But going back to the diagnosis, it absolutely put our jaws on the floor. And the fact they said that it was stage four. Yeah. Stage four lung cancer in my 23-year-old daughter who had this incredible life ahead of her and we'd done everything right. Like what, you know, I mean, we, we weren't perfect parents. My kids will give you the list. We go through it sometimes <laughs> of all the things that we messed up, but like we didn't smoke in our house. We know we don't drink probably not enough. <laughs> and so like, like what, what did we do? What did she do to deserve this? And nothing, it's mm -hmm. just one of those <laughs> crazy things as you know yeah, yeah we won the lottery we didn't want to win that yeah that is not the lottery that that we wanted to win and so oh it was i at the same time where my daughter is devastated we're devastated family back home and all over the country are devastated and wanting to help and i've never been so grateful for my faith and my family and my friends um you almost my daughter was so strong and we were having really really hard to sit discussions and decision and discussions and having to make decisions about things that I never thought that we would be mm -hmm. making decisions about mm -hmm. um, it was it was overwhelming at best um, and but she was I mean she we all had our times where we broke down and yeah. lost it um, it was it was really really hard, but I gotta say she is tough. She is one tough kid. I don't know where she gets it, but she is she is really really amazing. And the care that we got at Wild Cornell in those initial days and the doctors that she was um, affiliated with um, really helped us get through some pretty dark times. Mm. It was really a rough go um, until probably. Um, I don't know, maybe, I think I finally breathed a little bit, you know, maybe this fall, mm -hmm. you know, year after. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, we're two years out now, you said this is a two year mm -hmm. can anniversary or cancer anniversary. Um, how are things today? Things are good. Things things are good, and it's funny because my husband, my husband and I have had different roles in this cancer journey. Um, I don't know if you ever have done the Clifton Strengths Finders. I don't think so. Okay, so in one of, of one of my strengths is positivity. So I usually, and I have, I mean, for as, probably as long as you've known me, um, positivity is sort of my. That's something that kind of gets me through. My husband really believes in extra research, and so he's reading the Facebook posts and reading all of the alcohol positive research and and doing all of that and I'm looking into some of that but I'm the one that's gonna be like you know everything's gonna be okay everything's gonna be all right and there's a time and place for both I've learned sure. um, and they're not always mutually <laughs> mutually exclusive but um, she's doing well in um, earlier this year we she's been on electinib, which is um, which is a treatment that is relatively new and has been very successful in some of its patients. Okay. Um, earlier this year, we got a scan. I think it was in February that um, 
the cancer actually was not lighting up like it had on previous scans. So that was a day where I was with a friend from work and I was sitting, at, we were having breakfast and Betsy called because we, you know, we are on edge every time we have a scan coming up. Mm -hmm. She calls with the results and I lose it. And my friend, bless his heart, you know, he's just like, okay, I think I'm just going to pay the check and we'll get out of here. And I think I cried for two hours because it was the first time where we had significant um, change in her yeah. progression. And it was also the first time you have really tough conversations with your kids when they're diagnosed with something like this, where at first, you know, she would say, well, I don't know if this is my last birthday or if this is my last Christmas. That, that about did me in. When she got this diagnosis, when she got the scan um, in February, she said, I finally realized that I need to be living to live and not living to die. And I, again, that, that about floored me. And since then, we've had one more scan. We had one about four weeks ago, three weeks ago, and there's no progression. Awesome. So all of the cancer that was in her lungs, she mm -hmm. had a little bit in her arm. We want it to, it, it never hit, it hasn't hit her brain, which is where a lot of lung cancer patients where it metastasizes and it's not been there at all. Um, the one in her arm is gone. The stuff in her chest has really calmed down. So right now the drugs are, are doing its job and we are very, very grateful for that. Yeah. She also took a job where she works I wouldn't say a lot less, but kind of less. <laughs> and I also think that she realizes how important it is to live. I mean, to That's go right. and do things and experience things. And, you know, for her cancerversary, she's going to be with Taylor Swift in London, nice. you know, with hundreds of thousands of her very best friends singing, you know, yeah. good songs. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's amazing. Well, that's uh, very good to yeah. hear. I'm very happy to hear that, yeah. um, as you as you all know. Um, I'm glad she's, as you said, living to live. That's that's a great line. Um, what what advice would you give to another parent who has a child that's been diagnosed? I was talking to my husband about that particular question yesterday. I wasn't sure if that would come up, and there's no one size that fits all, right. which is so cliche, it's true. but it's true. And I think it does depend on the age of your kids too. Sure. You have books when you have kids, you know, that say, you know, what to expect when you're expecting and how to raise a toddler and how to do this and that. And the reality of dealing with such a difficult situation with your kids, and it can be cancer, it could be drugs, mental health, whatever it is, there isn't always the right answer. And especially when they're adults and you're adults, we are chocked full of the right answers. It's amazing how <laughs> we could help her, help herself, um, our boys. We, we, you know, we can just answer all their questions, you know, for them. Uh -huh. um, but part of the growth process is to also, we raise them to fly. Mm -hmm. And, and so we've had to find a really, so, we've had to find a good balance in being a resource whenever she wants to talk about what's going on, get mad about what's going on. Um, what we've not done as well that I think probably could be some advice for parents is try not to hold the whole thing up on our shoulders and not let um, your child know how deeply you're feeling about this. It's okay to cry with them and it's okay to be mad. Um, you don't have to store it all up because they want to know that you're in it with them. Right. Um, but I do think that also finding that balance of learn, um, be patient, have a lot of grace, don't miss any moments. Um, you don't want to miss anything. And I, and I live in an environment where work and my family and my friends didn't need that. They, they, they said go and, and be and do what you need to do with your daughter and to this day still do. Mm -hmm. So you take those moments and you don't take them for granted. But I think patience and learning and realizing when you have adult kids that they also are going to make some decisions that, you know, I wanted her to move back to Indiana 
Let, let's come back here. Let's get treated. You know, you can live at home in our basement. It will be great fun. We'll we'll take care of you. But she wants to stay in New York and her health care is fantastic. She has since moved to Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, mm -hmm. which is just state of the mm -hmm. art. And and I'm and Indiana University um, School of Medicine, um, my colleagues up there have been fantastic. If I need a resource or Betsy's been in town and there was going to be she, if we thought there was an emergency, they've got resources there too they're yeah. very dedicated but she wanted to stay in new york and you know she's she's a grown woman or a young grown young woman and doing big things and is capable of making good decisions so um gotta let them fly sometimes <sighs> that's right well thank you for sharing no yeah, it's not the, thank you. not the easiest story in the world but mm -hmm. thank you for uh, sharing that story with us we appreciate it mm -hmm. uh, and thank you for doing what you do, um, your dedication to the IU Foundation um, and, and being a partner with the Heroes Foundation is, is key. It's folks like, folks like yourselves that give us, I guess, the confidence in knowing that the, the dollars that we're raising and the way we're directing them um, are being handled in a professional way and, and being handled in a, in a way that uh, we can be proud of. Mm -hmm. At, yeah. All day long. I love that you're giving money for research. Um, I saw the gift that the Heroes Foundation just gave to the Notre Dame Correct, yeah. doctor, and mm -hmm. um, I know you've done a lot to support the Indiana University School of Medicine and their cancer research, but what I also love is your patient care work. Um, just as, again, as a mother of a child who needed extra help, it's amazing what kind of angels you're looking for in that situation. I know the Heroes Foundation really supports that. So thank you for everything. Yeah, well, thanks. We appreciate that. Um, and thank you for taking some time out of your morning in week number two. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Always love to see you. Yeah, likewise. And thank all of you guys for joining us on this episode of the Summits Podcast. We appreciate you guys from wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and those of you who turned in on the Heroes Foundation YouTube channel, thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it. And guys, don't forget, beat cancer. <laughs>